Hello, ladies and well, gentlemen. Hello, gentlemen, uh, to my uh, YouTube channel, WSI. My name's James, and thank you for joining us. And also, thank you to my next guest for joining me. He has been a Mountie. He has been a pirate. He has been a cannonball. But he is now currently the French Frankenstein. And the one thing he is not is human. PCO, how are you doing, my friend? I'm great, uh, James. Uh, how are you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah th thank you for wait thank you for doing this so early as well. I know it's is it 9 a.m. where you are or is it even Yeah, early? it is. In in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada, it's 9 a.m. <laughs> Yeah. There we go then. It's because everyone because I've because I've I've got a regular show with Don Morocco. That's eleven hours behind, so I have to get up in the middle of the night to do it for him. Everybody else is between five and eight, so I'm, I'm just glad that I uh, I got the right time for you, and like didn't yeah, come on an hour late nice. or anything and waste your time or anything. But yeah, um, so uh, I've already said basically what we're gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a ton of questions, and the first things first is generally I go to the beginning of your career, but. This time I'm not. Uh, I'm going to go straight to Ring of Honor. And um, generally, I start these uh, shows by um, giving you basically my first memory of you and as a fan. Um, but actually, my most uh, potent memory of you is when you were on the Steve Austin show a few years ago. And you were talking about how you want to get back into, uh, you know, doing one giant big run. And uh, the thing that really stuck out for me is when uh, Steve asked you, how your body was feeling uh, at 50 years old and 20 years hard of wrestling. You went absolutely fine. No injuries at all. I find that unbelievable. Yeah, it was the truth and it still is the truth. I mean, uh, I don't have any, uh, uh, anything whatsoever. I'm, I'm feeling absolutely great. <laughs> so uh, how many, uh, how many matches have you had since you've been with ring of honor then? Because of with the COVID situation, it's a bit of, bit of a yeah. up and down. It was like, yeah, it was a low schedule. Uh, but 2018 was uh, pretty heavy for me. I can be uh, with uh, four shows a week uh, for the whole year. And then 2019, probably had like um, 60, 70 shows over the year. And uh, the last two years have been really light. Yeah. I, I really, really, really light. Uh, 2020, we didn't have. We were off for half of the year, and then 2021, uh, basically, it's a uh, it's a tour every month, basically. So uh, it's about three, five match per month, which is kind of light, too light. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Well, actually, that was going to be my next question. Is it for you? Uh, since you know you you're older, but you're still wrestling and everything. Do you prefer wrestling more to get your body sort of in ring shape, or is it better to do less matches for you oh. physically? No, no, I'd like to be involved. I'd like to be involved. I'd like to 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 get in that that uh, that mood where you know you, you're wrestling all the time. That's that's much easier for me. Yeah, it keeps the uh, machine oiled, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Everything it's good for everything. If you don't do that, you almost uh, have to do uh, as much work uh, in training. Hmm. So it's, it's about the same, but it's much more fun with fans. Yeah, you might as well get paid for it as well if you're going to do the same. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing you mentioned on Steve Austin's show uh, was the, uh, the overriding goal, and this was in 2018, early 2018, was to yeah. hit WWE for one more big run. Uh, and obviously you went to Ring of Honor. And was it, uh, looking back in 2020 and 2021 with WWE, are you just like really pleased you didn't go to WWE now because their programming just seems to be like the worst it's ever been as far as creativity and you know being your own person and uh, you know coming up with your own ideas? I was uh, I was glad that I joined uh, Ring of Honor in 2019 because of uh, I had such a run in 2019. I mean, it was like uh, it was like probably the most uh, product you know produced. Uh, I mean, I've never had like such a productive year, such as 2019. Well, the becoming the world six man tag champs, the world tag team champs, the world heavyweight champ, uh, and then going to NWA, the NWA tag team champs, and the NWA Croc Cup winner. So it was like just. Uh, it was just amazing. The Madison Square Garden uh, sold out, you know, working with New Japan Pro Wrestling together on a joint venture. Um, having the greatest entrance of my entire career at the Madison Square Garden where everybody, the 21,000 people were chanting, uh, he's not human, he's not human. And uh, 
with all the electricity and the electric chair and the whole the whole thing was like so magical so crazy it was uh, unreal and uh, yeah that was cool that was one of my greatest wrestling year ever uh, and uh, it's just too bad the uh, pandemic hits uh, I felt like you know uh, Ring of Honor had like high goals. They wanted to go uh, probably toe to toe with uh, AEW at the time. You know, we were supposed to go live on uh, the Fox, uh, Fox Sports, and um, and then then everything hit, and then we kind of take a backseat. We took a backseat a little bit, and that was hard. That was. Uh, We went for uh, health measure first and safety, uh, health safety, and um, I mean for for me, um, it was hard. I understood the situation, but it was just uh, just everything came down crashing. Yeah, um, I mean it did for a lot of people. Uh, not obviously not just in wrestling and everything, but. Um... You know, uh, crowds are coming back in uh, the UK as well as America. So you know, you can always hit the reset button. You can either you know you can always restart and uh, and uh, you know uh, get back on the road again and do all the kind of things that you were uh, used to do and get back you know get the momentum back and everything. Um, and speaking of getting the mo- momentum back, uh, easy for me to say, is um, so in uh, it's about 2017, right? So uh, or 2016. I'm sorry, I've got my years mixed up. Is um, you retire from the ring for a few years? And instead of just going, do you know what? That was sort of done and dusted. You um, And you were always the quiet one, as far as I could tell, you know, with the tag teams and everything. You had, you know, uh, uh, Jacques Rougeau doing Jacques, the talking yeah. and raving, you know, all the time. You know, they didn't need three talkers, so you're always, always, always the quiet one. And then you just turn up out of the blue with this crazy Frankenstein character uh, where you're getting electrocuted and slashing. Your, oh, I tried to watch that video where you're slashing your chest and everything. It was like... I turned it off after 20 seconds. It was like, oh my god, it was too. It was too. Yeah, the, the, that that scar here. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Is that like a proper body modification, like one of those extreme body modification shops? You That's went what to? it is. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah oh yeah, my yeah. goodness, mate. So where did um where did the character of um do you know what I've I've been this that and the other. I'm going to come back with something absolutely crazy, the most wild off the wall um character I've ever been and. Uh, Sort of book the trend of everybody else who's just doing trunks and flips. Yeah, the thing is, 2000, 2011 uh, had a radio show in Montreal where they asked me where I thought my career, you know, what was going on in my career. And I thought, well, I, you know, I've tried pretty much everything. So it's like I've got a wall in front of me. So, you know, I think uh, I'm going to have to. Uh, just, just wait it off. Like, I think I, I thought it was like pretty much over, but I never officially retired. I just said that on the show. I think I'm going to maybe just retired, but, uh, and then got a few phone calls and I start to wrestle like on small different show here at home. And then eventually led off to a show in uh, Indiana. And when then Joy Janela was there and I tore the house down with Ethan Page. <laughs> Uh, Ali go Ethan Page from AEW, uh, and we tore the house down in Indiana for Black Label Pro. And Joey said, "I want you at the uh, at the uh, WrestleMania 34 weekend for GCW." And then I've wrestled Walter, and then that was probably uh, other than uh, I've had like <laughs> great matches in my career, but it was one of the greatest match of my career. It was awesome. Me and Walter, and then after the Walter match, like everything exploded. Like everybody wanted to book me, and every major like, companies wanted to sign me. And it was so tough to to make a decision and to go with Ring of Honor, but they they offered me like such a great deal, and, and they were so professional with me. And so, in between, I had met with Destro, which is uh, his premier thing. Is like. Uh, an all-time, uh, all-time strongman feats of strength. You know when you know walking with a horse. You know, those things where it's not like a bench press or a deadlift. Yeah, so, bend, bend in the pan and everything. Yeah, yeah the yeah. pan and the deck of cards and uh, all kinds of, of crazy things. So um, 
he, I, appro I approached him to train me because he had lost like for 15 years. He's been maintaining a loss of 168 pounds. So he was like 330 or 320. And he lost all that weight. Now you see how, how small he is, but he kept his strength. So I went to see him as a, as a coach. And then he became, we became friends. And then he became, he's a big fan of monsters. He's a big, big fan of our movie. And then the, when he saw me walking, we were just got done. I was just getting done doing an exercise and I'm walking away from him. And he says, you know, you're Frankenstein. And, um, he, he was raised and uh, born in Boston. And, um, he, he was pretty much alone when he, he got, you know, when he, he was by himself at three years old, most of the time. So monsters, uh, that was his world, you know, watching the Frankenstein movies and those movies. So, and the, so he, he, he had to work on the strength too, because he was laughed at at school and things like that. So basically strength and monsters were two of, the, <laughs> of his things. So he kind of, got me into that mood of strengths and monsters and and I always like people were always saying i was walking in a weird way and uh when he said that i knew he was not bullshitting me i knew it was <laughs> the truth I, I knew there was something there and i felt yeah I, I, i'm down with it you know that's that's gonna be awesome and then it was already people were already talking about the PCO's resurrection because of the match with Walter. So every everything made sense in a way without no without us knowing that that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. So it was a double story. It was the Frankenstein story, you know, resurrecting and the PCO story resurrecting, and we put everything together and then we went that direction and we never looked behind since then. Good man, good man. And you know, it's, it's it's a really inspirational story because as you say, you know, you were about 50 years old, 49, you're going to be 48, 49, 50 years old. And do you know what? If you've got yeah. the fire in your belly, you've, you can still do it physically. Just do it. If it's the dream you've got, just do it. Also, uh, it felt like Frankenstein was not a 20-year-old guy. It wouldn't work. <laughs> it wouldn't work to have a Frankenstein that young, you know, or, yeah. you know, Frankenstein was like that that old, you know, that, that that's part of the character, you know, it goes with it. So as long as you can do the work and you, you, get, you can be up to, you know, whatever uh, we're doing in pro wrestling today, why not? Exactly, exactly. Um, so we've uh, discussed, like, what inspired you to get back in the business in the uh, mid late 2010s. Um, who inspired you? Uh, so I'm assuming you were a fan as a kid uh, growing up, as most uh, professional wrestlers are. Um, Luti International, uh, were you a big fan of that? Were you watching that every week? And um, basically, who was the guy or who were the guys, who were the people who made you think, you know what, I can do this? Um, nobody. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it was just, I, I don't know, it was just in my, in my mind. I mean, uh, tomorrow I'm going to meet, uh, I got a phone call yesterday saying, hey, Bruce Hart is in town, Brett's brother. Right. And he, he'd really like to meet with you. So uh, um, that, I think Friday I'm going to go meet him. He's here until Sunday. So I'm going to go meet with Bruce. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, growing up, my uh, my the guy that I really liked were Dino Bravo because uh, he was the champ here for eight years at that time. And I remember getting in school, open up the newspaper and looking at the uh, wrestling ad and, okay, Dino's going to wrestle this guy this Monday, Paul Sobe Arena, and, uh, or this guy at the Montreal Forum. So uh, once a month, they would do the forum. And uh, Dino was one of my uh, favorite uh, star and Rick Martel. He was the AWA champ at the time. And he was coming back here at home with, with the AWA title. And sometimes Dino and Ricky would tag team together against the Road Warriors. So Road Warriors, King Tonga, Bravo, Martel, and the Rougeos as, as a tag team. Uh, and some guys that came in in between a little bit, so uh, from, from the States. Uh, but basically, that's what that was them. But uh, I couldn't really get like... Uh, 
I started wrestling at a smaller place, and then eventually I hear all the uh, the veterans from that that small place, guys that went to uh, Germany, that went to different territories that I never heard of, but you know, I knew it was not a, I knew it was true, and uh, and basically their thing was you got to get on the road, you know, that's how you're gonna. That's how you're going to learn some things. That's how you're going to grow as a wrestler and things like that. So uh, the, the Bruce Hart story is funny because when I turned 18, I started to train at 16. And when I turned 18, I went to Calgary. I was not speaking English at all, at all. I flew myself there and uh, I met with Stu and I asked him, I told him I wanted to wrestle. And he said, go talk to my son, Bruce. He's the booker. And then. I went to Bruce and Bruce didn't want to didn't want to use me at all. And then he said, you know, come to Calgary, which was like uh, Edmonton, which was like four or five hours away in bus. And then I did that back and forth Edmonton, Calgary, Calgary, Edmonton for three, four months, and then eventually. I uh, Kerry Brown said to Bruce, you, you can't do that to that kid. You got to give him a chance. And then he said, uh, okay, Friday afternoon, come to the stampede. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll practice. We'll have a practice in, in the ring. So he threw me a couple of times outside the ring and bumped me a few times and had me doing a comeback and things like that. And at the end of the deal, he said, no, you don't have what it takes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's going to be funny to meet with him and to, Cause I don't think he, rem he, he remembers all that. I think he, he knows that I wrestled his brother. He knows that I was part of WWE. He knows that I was the ring of honor world champ, but I, I don't think he remembers that story. <laughs> and for me, it's going to be awesome uh, because <laughs> the fact that he told me, he said no and things like that. I think it made me, uh, I grew as a wrestler. I, I know it was not going to be easy. I know you may have like 10, 20 no's before you get a yes. And uh, it was just uh, perfect, you know, like looking back. But back then it was so depressing, <laughs> so depressive, <laughs> so depressive, so depressive. You uh, you need to make sure that he picks up the tab for lunch tomorrow as an apology. Yeah. I think. <laughs> no, no, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> He's gonna, we're we're going to laugh our... Our ass out is gonna be so funny. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what. Well, well, apart from that, like really awful uh, first experience in wrestling and everything. Um, you do some independent stuff. You go to Puerto Rico. Um, obviously, we haven't got because uh, I know we were saying before. I've got like five hours worth of questions, so I'll skip Puerto Rico yeah. for now. And yeah, we'll no, go. no, it goes fast. Uh, from Calgary to the Maritimes, the Maritimes wasn't you know got fired after a couple of months from the maritimes then i took some time where i i felt like uh my head was wrong and then i got an opportunity to go to england for all-star wrestling wow. brian did the brian dixon yeah and then when we got there me and my partner rick crawford uh we we had so much success and then we stayed there for a while and then we went for renee lazardus in uh, germany and then from Rene, uh, which where Chris Jericho went to, uh, I got booked for auto vans. And it was one of those deals where they say, we have some room for you, but um, we can't bring your partner in. So that so was, a, was a tough decision. I was willing to stay with my partner, but he says, well, it's the kind of life that, you know, not knowing what's next or there's no security do what you have to do. So I went for auto, went to Puerto Rico and then met with Jacques Rougeau and then had a few tryouts with WWE and then got hired as a pullbackers. Well, um, just going back to Germany because three of the people that you either wrestled with or wrestled against are three of my favorites, Regal, Finley, Dave Taylor. You've got to have some stories about all three of them or at least one of them. Yeah. Well, we were, we, we were big, 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 big fans of Dave Finley. Uh, me and my partner, I, I remember we watched his match. We really like his work. Uh, we liked the way he, he was such a heel, you know. He was, he, and especially like in England, he was great. He was awesome. In Germany, he was even better. I mean, he was, his crowd just could eat in his hands, you know. He had so much control over everything he was doing. Uh, 
but I never felt like I was that tight with David, with, with Finley, but uh, I felt I was a good friend with him, but we weren't that tight, tight like I was with, let's say, Brookside and Doug Dean or even Steve Regal. And, and, and Finley and Taylor, they were pretty good friends, and it, it just happened that one time we're on a road trip, and uh, we're riding with Finley and, uh, and David Taylor, and me and my partner were in that back and for maybe five five or six hours during the whole drive to the show we kept yapping and talking in french <laughs> and they got annoyed like they were so mad that they couldn't understand anything we were saying and they and they thought maybe we we're you know cape fabian the boys yeah. or talking <laughs> in their back but we had no bad intentions whatsoever. It's our first primary language. We're 21 years old. We don't know any better. And then we learned our lesson. Like we learned our lesson there. Like we, uh, we made sure after that, like, because it came back from all the boys. Yeah, apparently you guys speaking French the whole time. And you're, you know, kayfabe the guys. And, and so, and so it was like uh, it was our probably during the first two weeks there. So it was it was uh, we got there with a little bit of heat, <laughs> but 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 I was there for a long time, like uh, between uh, Germany and England. It was probably three four years altogether, and I came back a few times, and uh, I felt like in Germany I got along good with uh, with every. All of them, but uh, Regal was good. It was a really good. I felt good with Regal, with Brookside, with Doug Dean, uh, even David Taylor, and uh, definitely was a guy that was like a little bit cold, but uh, but cool, you know. Hmm. Uh, but uh, we didn't hang out that much. But uh, we uh, we didn't hang out with all the other guys, you know, quite a lot. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I remember a story that William Regal says once about Finlay. Is uh, when he was about eighteen, he wrestled Finlay for the first time, and he was so intimidated by him that he just he wouldn't take anything at all. So he just ended up just getting eaten up, eaten up until Finlay himself said, "Do you not make comebacks?" And then, <laughs> oh yes, I do. And then he, you know, that kind of thing. So I mean, was it the same thing with Finlay? Just like like an intimidating dude to get in the ring with. Uh well, I can relate to Regal because Regal started when he was 16 years old. Uh, but the thing is, like, uh, the same thing happened with me and Bob De La Serra. I, For me, Bob De La Serra was a huge star. He had been for Otto as UFO. Uh, he was on TV with International Wrestling. And my some of the my first matches were against Bob. But it was a house show. It was not TV. And you used to see, you know, when you're a young kid and you're on TV, you get squashed, you know? So... Um, I'm having my, my one of the, the first match uh, with Bob, and uh, we don't have time back then. We didn't have time to talk about or in different sides, different different dressing rooms. Puerto Rico was like that too. You have it sometimes when it's a main event, the tape recorder with the finish at the end, but <laughs> everything was called in the ring, you know, except the finish sometimes when it was a big match. But that was an opening match against Bob. Uh, a house show and he, he wanted to give me things but i was too shy you know i was too like oh i can't do that it's bob you know and then uh, my my dad came to watch my match and said well why you let him beat you up the whole time you know <laughs> so, well i don't know it's bob that i sarah i'm doing my best you know so it was kind of a one of those deal i think that regal went through uh because when you're you're in the game and you know how it goes and you have the experience you you know, you, you take, you know, the time that you need to take when it's your time to do things, you know. So uh, that's that's the way that, uh, you know, Finley would work, you know. You, you, you might have been, like, uh, yeah, uh, impressive or whatever. But, you know, the, 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 the greatest thing about this thing is, like, I didn't, I didn't get along... I got along fine with him, but he was not one of my best friends, but he was my favorite worker. Yeah. It was just kind of, kind of weird. Yeah. 
but we didn't work him that much as a tag team. Uh, we had a couple of matches. I, I had him as a partner in Germany a few times. Uh, I didn't wrestle him that many times, a few times in tag teams, but mostly it was my tag partner during tag matches, which we got along fine. Uh, and then he became an agent in WWE when I was there. So when I was there for a while, he was an agent. So um, I always thought that WWE misused him so so wrongly because um, they they made him like a comedy, and he was anything but a comedy. Mm. He was feared. He was he was just a great one of the greatest wrestler that couldn't show on a larger stage mm. all his talent. And it took them time to hire him. Like, uh, they should have hired him when he was like 35, 36. When he, when I, when I was 21, when I got in England, my first time, he was red out at that time. And, uh, they brought him in for some dark matches and they didn't, didn't see anything in that guy, but, uh, he was, uh, yeah, he was one of the greatest wrestlers in England yeah, of was, all time. Yeah, he was one of the only people. Uh, he was the only, only people in England who had a finisher as well, which is the pile driver, and nobody else had a finisher. But I'll tell you what, I'll uh, I'll move on. Uh, you've already said basically, you know, your first few years of the career, and you got to the WWF. Do you remember the very first meeting you had with Vince McMahon? Uh. I think my first meeting with Vince, yeah, I remember I was not talking that much. I was very intimidated. Yeah, he's very intimidating. Uh, as uh, the Quebecers, I would let Jacques do the talk. And I remember uh, it had been a year. I was a champ. I was a world tag team champ with Jacques. And every time I'd see Vince in a Heil or, you know, in between the boys uh, and we had an eye contact or I thought we had an eye contact, I went to shake his hand and he was always turning around oh. or it was like, I was like, uh, uh, and, and I go to Jacques, I said, every time I want to shake his hand, like he's seen someone else, he turns around, he's pretending I'm not there. And Jacques stooped on me. And Jacques told oh, Vince, uh, <laughs> he said, he said, yeah, he said, why don't you shake his hand? Like every time he wants to shake your hand, you turn around, you pretend he's not there. He totally stooped on me. So I'm at a TV taping one time and Jacques's there with Vince and I'm coming at Jacques, you know, like I, I want to tell him something and I see Vince too. And I'm right in front of Jacques. I go to shake Vince's hand, and they turn around. He goes, Nikolai, <laughs> my friend. And I look at Jacques. It's a word. It's a word. It comes out. And he goes, and Vince turned around and said, <laughs> No, pal. Just, you know, tap me on the shoulder. I will always be there for you. I will always shake your hand. Blah, blah, blah. So it kind of break the ice. You know, it broke the ice. And, uh, and then after that, uh, as Jean-Pierre Lafitte, Vince was calling me home sometimes, to, uh, asking me how I was doing. And, and uh, we got the great relationships. Uh, uh, we, like I could have a, he said, my door is always. Hey. There you go, you're back. <laughs> Sorry, I got a phone call. Um, yeah, and then, uh, and then we always... Uh, you know, he, he always, like, uh, had the door open for me and I could have access to him any time. Like, uh, it was cool. It was, a, it was a time where I felt I was really tied to Vince at that point in time because I remember sometimes at the garden, uh, which is kind of his backyard, his home, his home basically, uh, he was watching my matches sometimes, uh, uh, giving me right away... Uh, you know, a good feedback, and uh, if I had like a guy who didn't take care of me, was pissed, you know. And uh, I remember one time he was pissed at the clown. It's that clown it's almost broke broke her neck, and he he showed a lot of support. So uh, 
I felt I felt tight during my Lafitte uh, time with WWE with Vince. Yeah, uh, you, when you say the clown, you don't mean um, is it Claude Giroux? Dink? Uh, the, no, the big it was one. The, the, yeah, the Ray really like a man. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just before we go to the pirate uh, uh, Jean Pierre Lafitte, and uh, I've got to ask you your first big, uh, and you thrown straight into the mix straight away. WWF Tag Team Champions the Steiner Brothers. You've got to have a great Steiner. You must have like twenty great Steiner Brothers story, surely. Well, yeah, they're not all good. Because <laughs> the Steiners were, uh, they were rivers. So, uh, and it was like, sometimes it was tough rib, like, you know, uh, and then we almost got in different fights with them. So, uh, but, you know, I've seen Rick lately a few times. Not Rick, I've seen Rick, but I've seen uh, Scott a few times. Uh, after our run and uh, he was always cool with me i never had like really uh i never, never had any problem and in the ring we never had problems with them they, they were always very professional in the ring they never tried to stretch uh, but yeah but you know jacques had a hell of a reputation you know with the dynamite kid and all that so uh nobody really wanted to uh fuck with him uh but um i remember one time uh we're in Italy and the Steiners uh they, they took just yeah that Claude Giroux the, the dink they taped him up to a pole you know <laughs> with, some, <laughs> with some duct tape and put some duct tape on him taped him up and they started chewing food at him and apples and drink cans it was not funny at a point it was not funny anymore and uh and Jock stepped up and told Rick to stop it, you know. And Rick, uh, and Rick said, "What are you going to do about it?" And Jock took an apple and he threw it as hard as he could uh, towards Rick, towards Rick's face. And uh, it was that pole where the, the midget was taped up around that that apple it was going straight to Rick's face, but it hit on the pole and it exploded. And then. Uh, I think it was uh, yeah. Italy was part of the of the tour, but we were in Germany when that happened, and um, and then we were next after the intermission against the Steiner. No so it was like it's like we didn't know what was going to happen in the ring, and uh, so we're ready to go, you know, just in case things mm -hmm. turns out to go go bad, and, and uh, yeah, it, uh, nothing happened, and we just had a good match. Um, we were we were a fan of Scott's dog. Yeah, I don't know him that much. Oh, fair enough. That because apparently he used to bring the dog round to terrorize whoever he was terrorizing that day. Then I, I never saw his dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll ask this then: Did you ever take the Steiner screwdriver? You know, the big inverted suplex uh, power driver. No, I was. No, I don't think he gave it to me. I don't think he had invented it yet. I think he invented it in WCW after the WWE. Like when they left Vince, they went back to WCW. I think that's when he came with it, came came with that move. But I took it from Brian Cage. And it was because uh, Cage is strong too. So uh, uh, he was using it uh, too as a finisher. But I never took it from Scott, but I would because I was taking pretty much everything you, they, they wanted me to take. Like, I, I, I never was afraid of taking any moves. And, uh, but I was good at taking the Frankensteiner. I was one of, uh, uh, you know, always made him look good with the Frankensteiner. Mm. Uh, just one more thing before I move because I've got a question very specific to England, and you've probably been asked this before, but just before I do, Raven. Uh, Johnny, I know Johnny Flamingo, Johnny Polo. Did you travel with him, and uh, was he as annoying as I imagine uh, to hang around with? He was not annoying, but we <laughs> we never traveled together <laughs> because uh, you know I was the rookie uh, as pullbackers. You know, I had, uh, I was just uh, Jock had been there with his brother Ray for a long time. He had been in the business for you know at a high level with the Rougeau brothers and international wrestling. So I came back, uh, you know, my, you know, I did, I did good in Germany and England and I did great. And, uh, and Puerto Rico, you know, wrestling all the stars there, the Carlos Colon, the invader, the guy, the, the guy that killed, uh, yeah. 
Bruiser. You know, uh, Bruiser, Bruiser Brody. Brody. Yeah, got along good with him. He was a nice guy. Uh, so, you know, never really bought into his business, but he was cool with me. Uh, Ray Gonzalez, like all the top guys over there, Salvia Vega. And, uh, but for Jacques, you know, I was a rookie. In his mind, I was, you know, I was, uh, I was just making uh, the big time. So I understood that. So I let him like uh, dealt, you know, the things. And and as, as soon as I got signed, like I got signed on uh, like June, yeah, June, nineteen ninety three, and September thirteenth, nineteen ninety three, we became champs. So and then we, we had the titles for almost a full year so three times you know we dropped it got it a week after dropped it got it a week after like so for like it was for a full full year but a couple of drops so um yeah uh well it's funny yeah. actually you've you've actually uh, uh predicted my next question then so we were talking about how many times you've been over to england before we started recording and you said oh i've been here tons of times you've been manchester tons of times what were the circumstances that somehow the uh, men on the mission, Mo and Mabel, ended up taking the WWF tag team titles off you uh, at a house show in London? Yeah, I think it was just, uh, it was at the point where uh, I think Vince wanted to uh, to say uh, anything can happen in, in WWE. Like, uh, it's not going to have this, we're not just going to have title change on Raw or on pay-per-views that can happen on house shows. So to, you know, get the fans, you know, to go to the house shows and expecting that something might happen, you know, to be involved in the drama that, oh, those guys might win or those guys might lose. And just, just to get that, uh, that, that, you know, that effect. And uh, that's why, you know, uh, we lost it in England. We gained it back in England. We we dropped it on Raw to Marty and the One Two Three Kid, and we, you know, gained it back at the Madison Square Garden during house show. So uh, that was the idea at that point, you know, for during that year or the next two years. Right. So I I'd actually heard at one point that it was actually a mistake and somebody forgot to kick out of something and they just went with it. Was it? It was always no, no, the no. plan. No. It was called. It was called. It was a, a, a titles titles drop that night. No, it was no no mistake. But I got to tell you, when uh, Mabel was splashing you or doing a cross body on you, yeah, there there was a chance that you might not kick out. <laughs> <laughs> My next question is: I'm even going to show you. Did Mabel kill you <laughs> with one of his splashes? <laughs> Almost. He uh, was heavy. Was it the um? Was it the one where he sits on your back? He kicks his legs out. Was that the worst one? I, no, I don't think he, he. I I don't think it was with this one. I, I, he did a yeah, a cross body of the second rope at oh the Madison nice Square Garden one time, and uh, his leg dropped. Like he broke a few faces with his leg <laughs> drop too. He was a great worker. It was like he wanted to be light. Like he, it's not that he wanted to. It's like he had so much weight on. Uh, I don't know. Yoko, Yoko was big, but Yoko was like, hmm. uh, I don't know. I, 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 he was known for, you know, hurting a few guys. And, uh, I think, uh, came back to Vince a few times that, um, people didn't want to work with him because he wasn't that safe, but he had a, a long run anyways, the big V or he had so many gimmicks. Hmm. Vince likes the big boys, doesn't he? I guess. <laughs> well, I'll move on from Mabel then. And uh, I'm actually going to give you uh, a little game. Uh, I keep calling it the personality test that isn't a personality test. It's uh, a bunch of uh, lines I'm going to give you, and you tell me uh, who best fits the bill uh, from any uh, fr uh, yeah, from any era, anyone you've ever wrestled. So, And you cannot say yourself. Uh, so the first, person, uh, the first line I'll give you, excuse me, is who was the last man standing at the bar? I would say The Undertaker. <laughs> yes. The strip club bar, I believe, as well. Yeah, you could drink and drink and drink and drink. So, <laughs> um, The wrestler least likely to go to the laundrette. 
razor. Oh, really? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> he would. He would have his uh, wrestling gear was like. My God, sometimes it was like pretty bad. <laughs> uh, most talented wrestler you have ever worked with? Probably Shawn Michaels, and it's a it's a tie between Shawn and Brett, maybe. Mm, you've you've predicted one of my other questions further on as well, but I'll carry on. Uh, this is a, this is one that no one ever gives an answer for, but I'll ask you anyway. The biggest stooge for the dirt sheets. Ooh. <laughs> it's hard to say i uh, i don't know i really don't know <laughs> okay um biggest crowbar the guy who just hit you hard on everything uh some matches were really hard me and bob holly but they'd go both ways like you'd say like i didn't know better like i'm wrestling him and like i feel like the punches are pretty stiff so i i punch him and then, and then eventually Bob comes, you know, we're having those matches where both of us see stars at the end of the match, but it's a hell of a match. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, Bob, uh, Bob had the, the reputation to, to work solid, to work hard, hmm. to work, you know, not, not that he would hurt you, but everything, he laid everything in there. Hmm. Uh, biggest ladies, man. <sighs> wow. Well, uh, I never, never had no one complaining easily. No, uh, I, no, no, nobody uh, comes to my mind as far as being complaining for all kinds of stuff. No, okay. Um, best rib that you ever saw or happened to you? Well, that one was good. Uh, I never, I never got ribbed that much that I know of. Maybe I it did. I did. I did got ribbed with Jock, but I, um, Owen was a good ribber. Perfect was a good ribber. The Steiner brothers. Um, yeah. Any particular yeah. ones that come to mind or? We were all like back then, like, you know, when you get to your car and you have like four tires sliced up, it's a pretty bad rip. <laughs> it's not a funny rip. You got, you got to investigate who did that, you know? So it's, it's but Owen, uh, Owen's like the kind of guy that was just, uh, he had the airport and uh, he knew it was like someone's jacket and he would just say, Hey sir, you forgot your jacket. And then the wrestlers, like the guy's looking for his jacket and he sees like someone with a jacket and he's like, like, this is not my jacket. <laughs> this is just like small ribs like that. No <laughs> one's it's good on that. Uh, Don Morocco always tells me when a, when a rib happened and it was a bad one, Mr. Fuji would always look around and go, we must investigate this case. And then he wouldn't, <laughs> yeah. and then he wouldn't investigate anything. <laughs> Yeah, but Fuji Fuji was known for for being a ribber, but he was like only Yoko's manager when I was there, and he was he he was up in time. So uh, I don't think he was as vigorous as he was when he was younger. No, fair enough. He'd retired from the worst of it. Uh, and the very last one, <laughs> uh, the best and worst road agents. Oh, <laughs> there's a good story uh, already. Cool. Here. There's a good story. No, I got, I got, I got along good with uh, with, with uh, Jack Lanza. I like Jack a lot. Jack Lanza, love him. Um, Chief J, uh, I, I like him a lot. Guria, and then I think uh, the guy who's like always stressed out and. Had to bring the guys to your position was Rene Goulet, yeah. Sarge Rene Goulet. <laughs> God damn it, guys! I was looking for you everywhere. God damn it! Like you gotta be here. You know you gotta be here. You know ten minutes ahead of time. And, uh, <laughs> he was so stressed out, and uh, he's like he is madman, <laughs> Rene Goulet. Who <laughs> was who yeah. was the man who was most likely to find you for being two minutes late? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. oh was mad. oh was it Rene? Yeah, Rene Goulet. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff then. Um, right, so um, Quebec has ends after about, let's say, a year or so. Um, you, you do a few months as a single just on the road. 
And then uh, you're given the uh, pirate character. Was this something you came up with or was this... Um, yeah. I, that was something you came up with? Yeah, because of my eye injury. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I uh, it was a tough blow, you know, being 12 years old. And I always wanted to turn that negative into a positive. And, and I always wanted to make something good out of it. And uh, I thought, you know, the use it as a character uh, would be part of, you know, uh, already had been uh, accepting the accident and accepting the fact that I, I won't see with two eyes for the rest of my life. And uh, I went through the, the whole process, but now at the point where I want to make money with that, you know, I want to capitalize on that. So, um, that's why I wanted to, to do that. But I wanted to do it in a different manner, a more uh, human manner. I wanted to be a heel with it for a while, and I wanted to turn face with it. Uh, I have wrote a whole scenario to Vince, and he probably kept uh, 50% of my ideas or 30% of my ideas and turned it into... Uh, a name that I didn't even know was existing for real. I didn't know the whole uh, Lafitte Boulevard in Louisiana, New Orleans. I didn't know Lafitte's were real pirates. I didn't know that. I didn't know nothing about that history. So they went that, that route. And uh, I was pleased with it. I mean, it was something, you know, along what I wanted to be and uh, working with the high batch. And so, uh, I just thought we never, um, it was a rough diamond that we never could find the layers on it because uh, it was too short of a, uh, but I was getting there, had that flag with my face in it. And then Vince, I showed it to Vince and then said, well, we're going to put it on the ring when you make your entrance. And then things were building up and things were going good. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So everything, everything went uh, the other way around. Yeah, um, I will ask that, and that'll be like the one negative sort of thing I'll, I will ask about because I've heard Kevin Nash's side of the story. But uh, before I do, do you still have the um, uh, like the doodles, the drawings, the design from WWF Creative Services for your outfit that you'd be wearing as the pirate? Uh, I don't think I do have them. Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. Um, uh, yeah, I, like I, I hope I still have that flag. I have fans now uh, writing me emails. They want whole gimmicks, you know. Uh, they're, they're ready to buy things off, you know, for souvenirs and things like that. But I don't know. It's like I, I threw a lot of things away. Uh, mm. Some suits and some boots, and uh, I should have never done that. But I didn't know any better at the time. But uh, who can predict the future? But now, like it's there's a lot of demand for my uh, Quebecer stuff, my Lafitte stuff, my Frankenstein stuff. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. You gotta wonder what these fans are doing with them. These these clothes that they're buying. Yeah, they want suits. They want. Uh, yeah, flags, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> they just love the memorabilia. Um, uh, do you know what? I was going to ask you about the Kevin Nash, the clip thing. Let's forget about it. Let's brush it under the uh -huh. carpet. Let's. Uh, well, what what was his uh, side of the story? Oh, his side of the story was he was told he was going to win in Montreal, and he was mm -hmm. just uh, and it was Powerball one two three, and that's that. He told me to finish like a couple of months before the right. date. Which didn't make sense in my head. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, take us through the full story then. So it was uh, in the Montreal Forum, wasn't it, that you were going to take on Diesel in the main event? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was just a, it's a long story. I don't want to go there. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was a, it was a, a title match. Uh, it was me, the main event for, for, with, with, it was Montreal, Quebec City, and Toronto with three towns. And, uh, and, uh, a couple of months before uh, Kevin came to me in Montreal, it's me and you for the title. It's going to be big jack, uh, big boot jack knife one, two, three. And usually you get that in the afternoon around 3 p.m., 4 p.m., you know. It's just when you get there or even 7 p.m., whatever. You, you know, you get Tony Guerrilla or you got an agent that comes to you. Okay, that, you know, 
that much time and uh, we want to get our champ over, blah, 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 blah. But everything that he told me, like, uh, a couple of months before was exactly how it came out from Tony Garilla's mouth. And, and I was already mad that he was so arrogant at the time to told me that. But, uh, yeah, and then, then I refused, and then it was a big, 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 big drama. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I had the click against me for a while, but a lot of people didn't like the click. But uh, just I just wanted to turn the page on this and saying that I get along great now with Kevin and uh, re-wrestled each other in Montreal in 2009. And uh, we went out. We had fun. Um, I got to know him on a different side, you know, and uh, – I felt like it's too bad that I did, uh, couldn't, you know, be wise enough to, uh, to just see another side of them, and him and Sean, because basically we're we're a little bit alike. That's why maybe we didn't like each other, and uh, and uh, yeah, so it uh, it kind of was the end for me with WWE after that. So. Mm. So it was a big move. Is it because the thing at the end of the day, like Kevin came up to me, he says, well, so you don't want to lose against me tonight? And I said, no. And then I had like, you know, uh, Briscoe going on the phone with Vince back and forth. You know, we know, you, you know, you're going to do this. You're a businessman, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll do it for Vince. Or I'll do it for you. But I don't want to do it for, for them, for Kevin, for Sean. So it's either a double can out or I'm going home. You know, that's it. And so we did the can out. And so it was like, uh, <laughs> that's, it was, that was sold out of the curtain. Yeah. For both nights, <laughs> Mon Montreal and Quebec. But we patched it up and uh, we worked it out, uh, me and Kevin, uh, a long time ago, like I said, 2009, maybe 2000. We we went over on different ways. Like diff we we talk about all kinds of angles, and uh, it's all it's all worked out. Yeah, all water under the bridge, which is good to know. I'll ask a couple of WCW questions. Um, I've got to ask about the brawl for all. We'll do the last bit, and then I will let you on your way. Um, but uh, one thing I've got to ask is: um, you come back to WCW as the amazing French Canadians with Jacques, and. Um, Jacques' hair had somehow just half of it had disappeared off his head in two years. And then instead of shaving his head, he grew a mullet out. Um, did you want to pin him down and shave his head for him at any point? <laughs> uh, the thing is, at that point, you know, when we came back, uh, I was not into the Quebecers being the same anymore. I wanted to have my own son. I wanted to grow my hair. I wanted to keep wearing my eye patch. I wanted to have my own. I wanted to be my own. Now I, I didn't want to be twins. I didn't want to be a tag team that much. Uh, I didn't care being called the Quebecers, but I wanted to have my own personality. And as I was growing my hair, he decided to grow his hair. You know, so it was just like he was trying to keep that tag team thing together. <laughs> That's the only reason why. You know. Because that, that didn't make sense. That didn't make sense for him, and uh, so I don't know why he did that. But I that that's that's the reason I came up there. I never asked him why he was growing his hair, but uh, I figure out since I had long hair, he wanted to have long hair. Yeah, <laughs> I was like he was growing all three of his hairs out to, to, <laughs> to try and match you. <laughs> uh, before I uh, before I move on, WCW Colonel Robert Parker. Uh, Man, just everyone's got a story <laughs> on that guy, and I always love a story. Always revolves around his cock for some reason. I don't know why, but um, any memories of uh, of uh, the colonel? Great guy, great great guy. Probably one of Jacques' good friend too, because uh, <clears throat> Jacques had worked in Pensacola during his indie years, and Colonel was like one of his best buddy there. He was uh, his brother was a promoter. Colonel was a promoter there, and. Uh, I think that's why they put him with us because they they, they knew he knew Shark and and uh, the French legionnaire. So now he's just a great guy all around. 
it's no funny. Yeah, uh, I, I no, can't, no, no, no special stories. So. <laughs> no, fair enough then. Um, I mean, I'm skipping through so much, and if I ever get to talk to you again, I'll like catch up and fill everything else in and uh, all that. But uh, you go back to the WWF, um, come back as once again. It's sort of just a continuation of the amazing French Canadians' outfits and looks and everything, and and the three hairs of uh, Jacques Rougeau. Uh, but I've got to ask you, and I'm sure you've been asked this a billion times: Brawl for All. I love the Brawl for All. Nobody else loves the Brawl for All. Um, I've interviewed Savio Vega, Mark Mero, uh, who else? A couple of other people from the Brawl for All, and I'd love to get your perspective on it. So um, who was the first person to suggest, uh, hey, we're doing this uh, real fighting thing, and uh, would you like to be part of it? Bruce Richard. With Bruce, it was like uh, I was home, and it was my family. It was this sunday or something i was a lot of people my uh, we're in the pool we're having fun and then the phone rings and i pick it up there was no cells that much back then so i pick it up and, hey carl bruce Richard, how are you great vince got a great idea for you oh vince got a great idea for me what is it yeah it's a it's a tournament you know it's gonna be like a short tournament you know with 20 ounce love and takedowns and this is a very real fight, you know? Uh, okay, so that's that's a great idea he's got for me. Yeah, yeah so you, you, you would go against uh, Dr. Death, you know, the Steve, Steve Williams for your first fight. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm in, you know. <laughs> but he went with the, the whole bracket, you know. If, you're, if you go to the final, you know, total, you can make 250... At five thousand per match. If you go to a quarter, it's twenty-five. If you go to semi, it's fifty. If you, well, if you go to the final, it's that much. But if you win the whole thing, whatever. You know, I came up with all the numbers, and uh, going to be sixteen participants. And um, so I was giving me the names, and I said, okay, but uh, maybe I had like two weeks, you know, to to. I was. And I never did boxing before. I didn't even know what the takedown was back then. Like a real proper takedown. I never wrestled in uh, high school or anything like that. And all my background in wrestling came from professional wrestling. So I had Phil Lafon showing me a few things one time when we were training. Like I didn't know much about amateur wrestling. So uh, it was uh, no end of the reputation of Steve Williams uh, being a... Uh, four-time All-Americans, a four, former uh, Oakland Raiders football players. He had a, such a reputation. He was such a bully, too. Uh, I've seen him uh, you know, beating up some guys, you know, like uh, students and things like that. And he's, uh, he's just like uh, one of those guys, just to just bully everybody around. So... Um, I took the match, and then I remember wrestling one time before a brawl for all, and he was watching my match just to see how I was, you know, wrestling, and he was really studying everything I was doing, and then eventually uh, we got on, and uh, Road Warrior Hawk came to me before the fight, and he said, uh, yeah, Steve, you know, Steve, he's pretty crazy, man. This is the money he tags you. Uh, just take a dive, you know, just, just lay there and he won't hurt, he won't hurt you, you know. And I look at Mike and see Mike, seriously, I want to win this thing. No, I'm not going to take a dive. Like, go back to Steven, tell him he's in for the fight of his life. I don't give a fuck about his fucking whatever he wants, you know, five friend. I'm going to get it anyways. I'm going to lose. So, so he said, okay. I warned you, so I went with Steve, and uh, that's it. I gave, I gave everything I had, and uh, yeah, I surprised uh, surprised a lot of people. I think uh, everybody was expecting me to get beat up badly, and uh, you know, uh, I didn't even get. Uh, knocked out or didn't get even injured everybody got injured in that tournament i you know i took him down a couple of times uh yeah i was 
I was pretty happy. I wish I could have done better, but I didn't have time to prepare. I was not ready no. for it. I mean, especially because, you know, I mean, apparently you've got no experience and you're going up against someone with huge experience, even if he's, you know, a couple of years, you know, removed from that. I mean, it's, it was a very good uh, acquittal. And also he's punching you in the back of the head quite a few times as well. I actually watched it just before I uh, came to speak to you. Oh, the thing is, uh, with one eye, like every time you... You facing you you try to face with the, the eye that yeah. you can see. You, you can't look. It's hard to stay square face to face, so you kind of sideways all the time. It's it's it's, it's uh, even me watching it after. It's different. <laughs> but uh, I was going for the home run, and I was going with with knowing what I know now. I would just stay compact, and I would just try to hit the the target. You know. But I was trying to go for the big knockout all the time. And every time I was missing and <laughs> doing all that energy, I'd, I'd, I'd put so much energy into every big, you know, telegraph punch. So uh, I so much wanted to knock, <laughs> knock him out <laughs> on his ass. <laughs> uh, I will ask a couple more things. I just I love the brawl for all. I'll tell you. Uh, just right. So obviously there was no athletic commission looking over this because I doubt they would have cleared you if you had a patch over one eye. So yeah. this was Wild West times. And um, before you went out, did Jim Ross ever get in touch with you and say that Doctor Death, that Doctor Death? Oh, he's going to be a tough one. He's going to get you. No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, no, I. Jim was always good with me. Uh, during my time in WWE, he wrote me nice uh, Christmas letter. Uh, he was uh, he, he was a fan for a while. Yeah, he was uh, he was pushing for me. Uh, I had Jim at one point. Uh, yeah, really in my corner. Uh, I felt like he was uh, he really liked me. He wrote me a nice letter, uh, Christmas card, our birthday card. Uh, yeah, for. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah. Uh, no, he, he, didn't, he didn't say, be careful or you're going to get killed. <laughs> uh, and one more thing. Um, you've got a WWF referee who's never refed a fight in his life as your referee. Did that worry you at all when you were looking at Jack Down and thinking, why, why are you refereeing this fight? Yeah, uh, I knew Jack because he was a ring crew guy. So I knew Jack for a long time, though. Like, I knew he was, you know... Uh, coming up and things like that as a referee uh but i didn't i didn't even know like he never refereed before but i felt uh i felt uh they should have let the mat they, they tried to push steve during my fight because they stopped the match with uh eight seconds to go and i don't feel i was in danger at all because uh Steve had no power in his punches anymore. Like he was, uh, he was out of gas, and uh, he, he he could not uh, he could not hurt me with eight seconds to go. Uh, so I felt they wanted to make it look like a KOT, you know, mm -hmm. uh, technical knockout, and uh, I didn't like that. I know the call came from from the guerrilla position. Mm -hmm. That wasn't Jack taking his own decision. Jack was not refereeing shit, you know. <laughs> right, so that I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for the info on Brawl for All. I can never hear enough of it. Um, I've got one more thing that I finish every uh, show on, and then I'll uh, throw to you some plugs and stuff like that, and then I will thank you for your time. So are you happy to go a couple more minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Right, okay then. So um, I call it the firing line. It's sort of like the personality test. I'm just going to throw some names at you that you've uh, worked with over the years. You tell me. Well, I mean, they're pretty much all going to be cool. I'm sorry, I'm not a big basher. I, no, I don't, listen. I don't like bashing people. Nobody is a big basher who comes on this channel. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. Everyone's always just like really like positive and stuff. So it's really, um, it's it, you're doing well. And trust me, trust me. So I mean, you're going to like most of these people anyway. So don't worry about it. And the first name is Sister Sherry, Sherry Martell. Crazy. Oh, <laughs> wild. She was pretty much outside the ring what she was in the ring. Maybe worse. <laughs> she, she was an absolute mad girl. <laughs> well, right. Drunk. Then. Drunk. She was out of her mind. She said she was just showing herself. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. She's crazy. <laughs> uh, Barry Horowitz. 
Oh, Barry is a cool dude. Cool dude, like very polite, very, uh, very uh, smart with his money. I'd say tight. Mm -hmm. You know, bring his tuna cans, uh, diet. Uh, wouldn't go in restaurants. Wouldn't spend money for nothing. Very smart. Very smart. Mm. Uh, El Gigante. I didn't have the chance the the chance to uh, to meet with with, with him. Uh, uh, not not that much. No, he was like I got in. He was getting out basically. Uh, Buff Bagwell. Uh, he was cool. He was. Uh, I was me and Jock. We didn't. We weren't going out. You know, we would stay in. Like. Uh, we didn't want to get involved with any problems, go to bars and things like that. It was that one thing, you know, when you're 25, 26, 27, and uh, you feel like you, you can't go out. Uh, that, that's one thing when I became a pirate, like I wanted to go out and I wanted to do things my way a little bit. And uh, uh, I wanted to experience things. So I, 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 that's why I wanted to be on my own for a little while. But uh, Buff, yeah, nothing, uh, nothing special about no. him. Uh, Shane McMahon, uh, very cool, very great guy. Like uh, uh, totally the opposite of Vince. Like as, as far as uh, Vince's uh, kind of uh, intimidating, uh, you feel like it's hard to get to him, uh, hard to approach. Uh, because of the entourage, uh, you know, it's got so, you know, he, he makes it hard for everybody because he would uh, spend his whole day, you know, talking to each and every one and trying to explain why he's not pushing such and such guy and things like that. But Shane is, uh, is just one of the boys. Cool. Mm. Like him a lot. Uh, Lex Luger. Uh, Lex had that... Uh, a little bit like I, he was always cool to me. I've wrestled him many times uh, against him and uh, was on the road a lot with him. Uh, but he had like that, uh, that you know, chin up a little bit, walking straight and, uh, you know, uh, super confident. Like, at least in his mind, he was like, uh, you know, he knew maybe he was in great shape and he was like, uh, the big deal for the company, but that's it. You know, he would say hi to me, they'd talk to me, talk to everybody, but he was like, he was like uh, another level up, maybe. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Baba. Miss Baba, who's that? Uh, Giant Baba's wife. Uh, you, uh, this might be a terrible question. Ah, I never met. I never met her. Oh, okay, met her. I know you're in old. We were in old Japan in '99. Yeah, because yeah. it's dealing mostly with Johnny Ace. Right. Okay. I'll uh, move on. Uh, Rikishi. Ah, oh, great guy. Great guy. We wrestled them a lot, and uh, he he knew that I knew that he he came in Montreal when he was sixteen as a loafer. Oh, really? And uh, yeah, he was an awesome baby face. He was like a. Like almost like Tonga Kid here. Him and uh, Samu both were in Montreal for a, a long period of time. Samu was probably the youngest international international champion in Montreal. He was 20 years old. Fatu was 16. So I grew up watching them, and uh, they always loved Montreal. So they were always talking about Montreal. So it was a natural fit. Uh, Quebecers, head shrinkers. Yeah. Mm. We uh, got along great. Yeah, did you ever? Um, so I know, obviously, you wrestled. Uh, you must have wrestled the head shrinkers at some point, because or were you always? Yeah, 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 guys? yeah. Yeah, we dropped, we dropped the belts. Oh, of course, yeah. Because at some point, the head shrinkers went good guy, didn't they? And I can't, uh, yeah, I can't remember if uh, you were still bad guys at the time. Yeah. Well, no, they they booked us again. Like we're bad guys, but I think one time uh, Poughkeepsie, New York, they put head shrinkers, Quebecers. I think just to know who was the most hated team or who would come out. <laughs> it was probably a test to see if we could drop the titles to them, uh, two heels teams or whatever. So yeah, we, we, we did it in Burlington, Vermont when we dropped the titles. So we were, we like, 
20 minutes away from Montreal. And so it was like we were on down. So we were a big baby face when we dropped the titles to them. Uh, Brian Adams. I uh, didn't know him that much, but knew Brian Clark a lot. Mm. Like traveled a lot with Brian Clark. So, but Brian Adams was cool when it, when I was there. Like he was really really cool, super nice dude. Uh, Brian Clark, super nice dude too. Yeah, We've got a few more then. Just a few more. Uh, Duke the dumpster Drozzy. Yeah, got along great with him. Uh, he was, he came. He just came in when I was there. It's Lafitte. Uh, but uh, he was just, uh, yeah, I was surprised to, when I hear his stories, to find out that he was getting closer to a lot of the other guys that I never thought he would be that close to them. So uh, yeah, I've learned a few things, but he was, he was a good guy. It's cool. I w- uh, well, that's a, something I've never heard of, um, but I, I won't press about it. Uh, Kevin Sullivan. Uh, you know what? When I was with WCW, I didn't get a chance to talk to him that oh, really? much. But when I when when I was with MLW, mm. he was such a nice guy, and he's one of the guy that really liked my my new character, the Frankenstein. And he says, "Man, I wish you to make millions and millions of dollars with it." And he was like, he was so sincere. He was so. So down to hurt, and he was so cool. Uh, yeah, man, I really liked him. Uh, Bill DeMott. Cool guy. Yeah. One of my partners in Japan. Uh, we tried to become a tag team in WCW. Uh, they gave us like a, a dark match. I don't know why it didn't go through. I think we could have, we, we, we would have done great. I think it would have been awesome to, to, to be a tag team in WCW with him. And the very last one, Marty Gennetti. Uh, it's just a, it's just a, it's like river too, kind of a river. <laughs> and uh, he knew how to get under Jacques' skin. He, instead of saying Jacques, he would always say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're working together tonight. <laughs> so, so at oh. this, uh, yeah, it's just he knew he would say something, but he would knew when to stop. So, but uh, I heard that crazy stories about him throwing if, TV down. If I sorry, what was that? Throwing TVs? TVs outside the second floor of oh, a right. hotel room <laughs> down to the street and different kinds of things in the WWE. Hmm. But uh, yeah, no. But with me, always we always had great matches. Uh, he was pe- teaming up with the the kid, so with Sean uh, Waltman. It was good. Other than just those uh, those words, you know, just trying to get Jacques to uh, to be mad a little bit. That was it. <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's the perfect one to end on. Uh, just before you've got to throw me some plugs. So, uh, who in Ring of Honor is uh, that you look at right now and you think, you know, buddy, you are box office. You are, you could headline any pay per view anywhere in the world. You are going to be the man. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Brody King is uh, super talented. I think he's uh, he's on his way. You know, he's on his way to become something something great and something big, but there, there's so much talent. I think Bandito is great too. Uh, I think it's, he's, uh, he's the champ right now. And I think it's well-deserved. I've seen him in PWG, like doing like some unbelievable matches, uh, even in ring of honor too. But I, I think he's, uh, he's, he's young. He's super young. So I think he's got a great talent ahead of him. Uh, I think some guys are just about to explode there. They haven't reached their full potential yet, but uh, tons of talent, um, tons of talent. Hmm. And uh, we all know that PCO is not human. PCO will never die. But uh, has PCO got years left in the tank still to get in the ring and get it done? Uh, PCO wants to do a stadium before uh, before he retires. Hmm. Uh, the Montreal Stadium... The Olympic Stadium. Uh, I, want, I want to do a stadium. I want to headline a stadium before. So that's uh, that's a thing. 
I'm always working on something. Uh, no, but uh, no, but that's the thing. I I always wanted to do is the uh, I, I did the uh, Sky Dome in Toronto against Hedge uh, when it was his debut uh, when he debuted in WWE. Uh, we did the Montreal Forum. We sold out Montreal for me and Jock for his retirement match. We were supposed to go to the stadium in Montreal. It was supposed to be PCO against Bob Backlund for the world title. That didn't happen. Got canceled by Vince, you know, uh, because Macho Man went to WCW. A few things happened that that show got canceled. Um, Dino Bravo wanted to do it, like uh, me and Jock wanted to do it. A lot of guys wanted to do the stadium, so it's always has been there. And uh, I don't know, so uh, that's that's there. You know, uh, it's one of those deals. You don't know how you're gonna get there, but you know you're gonna get there. Well, I think your uh, pro proof's in the pudding. I mean, it's never too late and persistence pays off and everything. So, you know, if anyone's going to do it, I'm sure you're going to do it. And do you know what? I keep saying PCO, but I wanted to prove that I could pronounce your surname right. Willette, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's the perfect pronunciation. That's yeah. that's very... That, that's, how I, that's why I came up with PCO, because I was... My name was getting butchered so many times, <laughs> but you got it right. And, and, I, and then also... Uh, yeah, I've, I'm I'm working out in the in the ring uh, every day, trying to get better at doing so many things. Uh, I want to improve. I'm still there. I want to improve. I want to get better. I want to do things in the different ways, and uh, I've got a lot to offer. Good so. man, and he's. For God's sake, like get that stadium tour booked. Whoever's whoever's got a stadium and they're willing to rent it out and get them in the main event, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Right, I'm going to do the sign-up now. So thank you very much, uh, PCO, for joining us. Thank you very much for joining us as well. And we will catch you next week. Cheers.